uh, future networks, and he will talk to us about uh, applying AI to, uh, to the networks. So it's a very interesting topic. So thank you, Diego. Okay. Hello. I seem to have... Uh, uh, well, the, uh, the, uh, it was assigned, well, now it's, no, now you're not only, only seeing me in my colorful shirt, but as well the, uh, the slides. Basically, the idea when, when talking about this, um, this presentation and the, idea, the general idea that uh, Peter and the organizers uh, were mentioning me about talking about AI, and to reflect some, uh, some of the uh, recent uh, more than results, I would say, ideas that we have been discussing about how we can apply uh, AI uh, for network management. The idea was, well, thinking about talking about something that uh, now is becoming a very hot term in the discussions of the next uh, research programs that is about precisely smart networks and how we can nurture these uh, smart networks in the future and how we can apply for it. Well, looking, looking about it, I, I decided to go through the um, Oxford Dictionary, and I found that smart has three different meanings in the, uh, let's say, uh, in reverse order of how common these meanings are, we start with something that it has to be fast, something that has to be stylish and uh, elegant, and something that, uh, well, has to be intelligent. That is a term, the, the f uh, meaning that we normally use when talking about smart networks. And well, when we're talking about uh, uh, smart in all senses, and we talk about what means uh, fast. Fast is not only, I mean, a fast network is something that, uh, well, we can take it for granted. During these days, we're talking about terahertz, gigahertz, uh, spectrum, optical, um, photonics, whatever. This is something that naturally the network would be, hopefully. But we are talking about fast, fast, uh, uh, fast networks when it comes to how they are managed, how they are verified, how problems are addressed, how security is enforced, and how fast in all other senses senses of the network as essential tool for whatever the uh, um, IT service. Second, it has to be stylish. It has to be, I don't know how to call it, not posh. Posh is, uh, is, uh, is not a good uh, way, but this, that implies that uh, being stylish is that it's nice to use, that you don't feel when dealing with the network is something that is, you can do with the network whatever you want without too much hassle. Easy to understand, and not only, only easy to understand for users, even most, more important, it has to be easy to understand for those who manage the network so they can see what to do in case of problems. And the most important characteristic about being stylish is about straight to tune. So you, you know which are the levers that you had to pull and you, which are the, the wheels that have, you had to turn for things to happen. And for sure, intelligent. You have to make it uh, to have all the uh, good properties that are supposed to, that networks will have in the future in order to adapt to uh, the demands and the different applications that we foresee in the, uh, in the future, able to scale, able to adapt to very different um, scenarios, something that is important, multi-purpose, so it can adapt can, can uh, be used, a single set of, in, of, a single infrastructure can be used for many different purposes that are not, nece that are not necessarily aligned. Um, basically, all these, and this has to deal with another word that has become, uh, become at least in the, uh, among operators and the industry in general, which is about transformation. We have to transform networks. We have to make networks something different, better, and that has to, to have, in my view, two uh, basic properties. One is that uh, they, has, they have to continue to be sustainable, sustainable in, in all senses, and basically, um, in the most important sense, economically sustainable. They have to be something that's still profitable, that uh, in which innovation, new contribution, investment, has a clear return, because otherwise we will end up with a, 
completely ossified environment in which the network will not evolve in a certain moment, it will, it will evolve too slow to adapt to the new applications. And well, to some extent, if you allow me, it has to be sexy as well. It has to be appealing for people to work on them. Uh, something that I have heard very often is precisely the situation that young engineers, brilliant people, don't, work to, uh, don't want to work any longer in networks because the uh, appealing staff is on the, on the OTT level, on the services, content providers, all the like. And that, uh, well, the idea is that with this transformation, networks can become, again, appealing and, and innovation can happen not only because it's, uh, it's profitable, but as, le as well because it's appealing to, uh, to talent. At this, this transformation is about precisely based on what is the evolution of a software network, I mean, uh, uh, SEN, NFV, uh, intent-based networking, whatever it has to do with making the network more uh, adaptable, plastic, uh, Plastic, yes, plastic is a, is a correct name, though when you talk about a plastic network, you can think as well of a network made of plastic. That probably is not that bad if you think about that plastics can last for 400, 500 years without deteriorating. That would be a, an ideal network if you think about it. Well, taking advantage of all these characteristics when it comes to the uh, uh, to software network, making them much more elastic, much more homogeneous in the uh, in the in the foundations, programmable and su uh, suited, suited for supporting instructions. And well, things are changing. I mean, and th this is why that makes it not only that we are changing the, uh, the, the origin, we are changing as, as well the targets. Things are changing because the uh, now, well, the internet probably we know, we knew at the, uh, at the end of the, uh, of the um, 80s, beginning of the 90s, it's changing, everything is encrypted end to end. What uh, the way in which we used to manage the networks is changing. There is no more access to certain information, etc. Well, 5G is coming, as you probably have had around. So basically, to, to do so, the idea is to apply something that is decades long, uh, old, which is automatics, is about applying a, a closed loop, a, clo a control closed loop, that is, in fact, is what has been applied, is being applied right now. To some extent, it's probably it's not a full closed loop, it's always an imperfect uh, closed loop, but it's being applied in the part of the legacy solution that you have, uh, you have the plant, what is called the plant in, in automatics, so this is your network, you collect information, those, infor the, those data is fed into mechanisms mechanisms that provide, acquire the data, pre-process it, they pull them in, into a policy engine, and out of the policy engine, you get some actions. Very, very often right now, with some, uh, with some human intervention, the only thing that you do when you are applying artificial intelligence is just that you are pushing data for, uh, beyond the closed loop and you are somehow widening the loop with an element that is uh, an AI engine. It's something that can apply some techniques that mimic uh, uh, human intelligence. First of all, and this is very important, it's not a so radical change in the architectures. It's a radical change in the tools, but not in the, in the mechanisms. It's not, uh, not this change in the, uh, in the way of thinking of how to apply this. Whenever people tells, uh, tell about, no, no, we are going to do something completely new, we're going to apply AI, yeah. the only thing is that you're using a different kind of hammer, probably an extremely powerful hammer, probably an electric hammer that is able to uh, uh, tumble down walls without any effort, but it's a hammer at the end. It's a tool, it's a tool for enforcing policies. Second, and this is very important, AI sounds very strong. Sounds, and people tend to think about this thing of a, that is the, I, I think I have blurred it too much because it's the Skynet symbol. It's the, sim, the symbol of cyberdyne systems. Who knows what cyberdyne is? Thanks, Ricard, thanks. Have you seen uh, Terminator? Sayonara, adios baby, sorry. That sounds, uh, Cyberdyne is the, the company that built um, Skynet that was the, the creator of the Terminators. It's not that we are creating, well, for the moment, we are not creating a Skynet. In my view, 
the, the coming AIs, the coming AIs will, sup, uh, will uh, somehow supply capacities that we don't have. But the same way, we don't have the capacity of building, uh, of making honey, or the, we don't have the capacity of smelling a bomb in a packet, like dogs or bees do. We are going to rely on, on, on devices that will be smarter than us in particular things. We have to train them, and we have to take advantage. And that doesn't imply that they are not dangerous. You know, a Rottweiler can be extremely dangerous, <laughs> or, or a pit bull. But again, it's something that is, notice that uh, something is coming that will take control of the network and do whatever it wants uh, to it. And in my view, something that is important as well, the key matters for the networking community is not about, about what is inside the engine. If you are uh, building a house, you don't care about the steel the, uh, uh, the hammer is made of. Well, unless, unless it breaks and it's a very bad uh, steel, but you care more about how you build the, uh, the, 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 um, the house. It's more about how we build all these two streams there, the data stream and the action score stream are more important in that respect for you, as, for us as a, as a networking community. Well, this is just to illustrate that uh, we have seen proposals of extending these control streams all over the place in the, in the access network, in the core network, in the cloud uh, part of the, of the network, at all layers. So you can imagine that can, this can happen all over the place, and for sure, you can think about an almighty AI that controls everything. And the uh, next step, and it's about machine learning. Machine learning, which is an aspect of AI, and it's a way of programming the AI, is simply, if you think about it, it's simply adding another double loop, I mean, another loop. So what you have is a sort of an eight, or an infinite symbol, in which you have two loops, in which the, uh, uh, the AI engine is in the, in the intersection. So in one, in one case, the AI engine is controlling the network or controlling the plant, whatever it is. In the other case, the AI engine itself becomes what is being controlled and what is being involved. But at the end, it's again a double loop of actions and data and something, something that is modified by uh, an algorithmic process. Well, if the, depending on the, uh, you, we can think about different ways of, uh, of, uh, of how this double loop is applied. And uh, well, you have the, uh, the several mapping on the current the terminology about what is supervised learning and supervised learning, reinforcement learning, etc. And even what is uh, even equally important and has been long forgotten because now it's not any longer um, a term in fashion with this about do, do, who remembers here expert systems, which are the old, the old fashioned AI, which is, was about precisely collecting the uh, behavior of a human expert and making a system implement it. But the feedback or the original uh, input of a human expert in some places is extremely important because it allows us to shorten very much the, uh, uh, the development and the, and the time for convergence of the algorithms. So the end is something that, as we will see later on, having a human at, at the end is something that helps. Well, if we think about the uh, data stream, basically, I mean, and very often I refer to this and say, well, no, let's not talk about AI. Let's talk about data-enabled management. It's something that you get some evidence from the plant and you derive some uh, conclusions and some actions on top of the plant for those data. The important thing, I mean, and I was try to be polite, I mean, correct, and not use very strong words, but basically is that you get crap inside the AI system, you get crap outside of the AI system. If you feed it with data that is not accurate, that is not correct, that is not, not, doesn't reflect really what you want to adapt, at the end, you get pure nonsense. What makes extremely uh, delicate that issue because even when you have fed an AI system with correct data, you have trained it with correct data, if those data are tainted, the output of the AI system will be tainted. Think that that's very important because that happens even with the humans. If we are very well trained, but they, we, we, are, we are provided with incorrect data, our conclusions will become completely incorrect. 
It's important that we maintain a set of properties, and something that is very important as well is not only about the data itself, the system, the same as we do, as we uh, the humans do, or, or in general, uh, living being, beings uh, do, we need some degree of metadata to provide the, the correct framework for the data to be, uh, to be useful. This is something that normally translates into, this is a word, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, being, being uh, um, a strong admirer of, uh, of a Polish writer that is called Stanislav Lem, I tend to, uh, he has a couple of, uh, of characters that was called Troll and Clepatius, and they are, among other things, they are applied ontologists. They create real beings from their thoughts. And this is something that we need as well here. What we need is an is a, is a ontology for this data, a network data ontology that sounds, I mean, I know it sounds very, very heavy, very philosophical, very complicated, but it's something that we are not far away from that because we have plenty of data models right now. People is working on, in ways in modeling at different ab abstraction levels how a network behaves, precisely working in a convergence of these data models into, into a single way of referring to it is something that is essential if we want to have, well, artificial intelligence is taking care of the network in, a, in an understandable way. And at the end, what we're th is, uh, is about precisely the idea that a, a enhanced data fabric that makes uh, a, a allows a convergence of the current um, um, measurement and, and telemetry streams is something that it would be the way to go and the way to achieve this, uh, this ontology. The other side, the action stream, well, it's a little bit more complicated given the current uh, situation because when it comes to the different actions for, for operating and managing uh, different domains, networks are, networks are a little bit more homogeneous than they used to be in the past, but still. They are complicated, goals are different, goals here are even contradictory even inside the, the, the same provider. So, well, there are some initial strategies that would help in this, in, the, in achieving a better, or in, in moving the, towards a better understanding of how to provide a consistent uh, action streams that are, well, for sure, it's domain specific. You, you do run, you go for the radio, you don't care, you don't care about anything else. You do uh, IP routing, you go for the routing, you don't care about anything else. Second is our recommendation systems, are systems that tell that tell humans what they could do or what they should do, but at the end it's a, it's a matter of, the, of a decision of someone that is able to integrate. And third, which is something quite uh, interesting, is autonomic protocols. People have been working for a while in systems that are going to have the property of uh, keeping themselves in a, in a particular state, not necessarily smart, but what you do is something, is a, you, you, what you do is that you provide, they have rigid policy rules, what you provide is the input to those rules. You can, that in, implies to take a step back or a step higher in how you define this and if you can realize that what you are, you are controlling is a system of a, with a certain degree of autonomy once a clear um, a, a strict policy has been established, you can rely on it to, uh, to, uh, um, to control it. Something that in my view as well, which is something similar to the ontology and could be the foundation for an ontology for actions, is something that we have started to work in the ITF in a particular uh, group um, on security, which is about the capability models. The idea is that you expose the, um, uh, the functionality that is uh, available in a, in a, in a formalized, object-oriented way and you can derive conclusions for it. Let me say this, this is something that is starting and I think that if you have in mind whatever the project for the future, if you want to explore either data ontology, either capability models would be something interesting. And third, we, we were talking about humans, humans in the loop. And for this is something that is important is precisely how we, you know who's, who this guy is? Just a guess. No? Does the name Hegel rings a bell in your, in your minds? 
Carl Friedrich Hegel it was, right? It was the, the, a philosopher that was the inventor of the dialectics. The idea that you have a thesis, that there's something that appears, some ideas that appears, and antithesis, that are those ideas that appear precisely as a reaction uh, to the original thesis, and the process of, uh, of dialectics that at the end ended up historically producing a, synth a synthesis. That was the com a combination that made uh, that made thesis and antithesis compatible. And then from that moment on, you can start another cycle of dialectics. The, basically, this is, this is the idea here. You have someone, something that has, has been, is being uh, requested by network users. You have uh, this in a, in a context that, in principle, is precisely against it. I mean, it's, a, it's a policies that are imposed by the operators, the requests from other uh, users as well that are competing with your request, and what you have is you need a system, I mean, that is, behaves like a human and that is, at the end, is programmed by a human that is able to establish the synthesis that you need for making the whole thing work. Apart from that, and this is something that uh, we are moving around and this is very much related precisely with intent-based networking and how you express what you want and how you express what is allowed and what you, how you reconcile the different uh, uh, I want to, to make us something that we can do at the end. Something, there are two things that are imp important uh, as well, which is about, about how you make it trackable and uh, understandable, the decisions, because think about that currently, current practice in artificial intelligence is you have the neural network, you have a black box, and you have a, something that you cannot understand how it behaves. You put something in, you get something out. The problem is that unless you can understand what happened, you, you miss two things. One is the technical thing, that is precisely, you put something in, you, go, you got something out, you would like to know where was the error if a, if, a, if a wrong decision was taken, where was the error, whether it was in the data or whether it was in the, well, whether it was inside the, the whole thing or whether it was something that uh, had to do with the policy, with the, with the antithesis there. How, whether you make some error when defining the basic rules for, um, uh, the, the, the policy rules for behaving. To do so, you need to have, a, you, you need to have a, some kind of track of why the decisions were taken. Not necessarily how. I mean, you don't need to understand that neuron seven in level four had a weight for input C that was incorrect. What you need to do is that, well, no, the rule that said in all cases, gold service gets complete precedence was wrong. And that's something that you need to do. And this is something that is important as a, as a required condition for having AI usable for. And there is a second thing that is very important. That is in networks are in many cases critical infrastructures. And you need something that is essential as well, that is a scapegoat. You need someone to blame. In case that something wrong happens, you need someone to say, well, no, 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 it was not my fault, it was his or hers. The, uh, the, uh, 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 jokes apart, this is important as well because you had to identify in the whole machinery where the piece that failed was to reply it, uh, to replace it. Sorry. And finally, security. As I said before, it's not that we are going to create Skynet. Probably we are going to create or to apply dogs, shepherd dogs, or or um, pointer dogs, or whatever. But still, a dog can be really dangerous if it got smart. And something that we need is uh, two things. Is, uh, one is the possibility of dealing with these circuit breakers. If you have an AI that for whatever the reason goes havoc, you need to stop it from controlling the network. And something that is important as well is that, for example, when talking about security, all people is talking continuously about, oh, well, good, we will have our AI to detect attacks and to, and to mitigate them. But we're not taking into account what happens if the, if the, if the bad guys have an AI as well. They can and they will have AIs. And in some moment, we have to be prepared to have an AI able to fight another AIs. And that's, let me say, this is essential because in the moment we have the first AI able to manage the network, the black hats will have an, an army of AIs attacking the network. Well, I'll, I'll try to, to go f a little bit faster. 
Something that is important as well, and this is something that has to be applied because so far AI has been applied to quite centralized environments. We have been talking about image recognition, diagnostics, all are very, very much centralized um, um, tasks. We're talking about something that is highly distributed as, a, as, as the network. So that implies that uh, probably we should take some advantage about this distribution and we have to reflect the distribution in how we apply AI as well. And that implies, well, different dimensions we're talking about. It's about how you aggregate knowledge of data. I mean, let's go a little bit. This data plus metadata, as we were talking before. How do you combine decisions? How do you make it completely independent, or you can, or you make it selfish and HAI runs for its goals, or you make it more or less cooperative? And how do you think about the different elements, whether they are allocated to a particular place or they are able to move around the network or to collect, to collect data and to apply decisions? How, do you, uh, how we map this onto the network topology and whether the combination of the different AIs has to follow a particular topology, and how we implement this communication, whether we reuse uh, uh, the uh, string mechanisms we are talking about, these ontologies for data, and these ontologies for, for actions, or even why don't we go the traditional way and we keep applying BGP, as BGP has been applied almost for everything in the world, even fry, uh, making fries. Just to, just to finish, oh, well, this is, uh, there are only two left, if I remember well, because here I see that we, I am in slide 29 of 89, and I got a, really a little bit concerned about that. Um, it's uh, something that is uh, extremely, as I said before, is uh, crapping means, means crap out, and we need data. The problem with data right now to uh, uh, train or do anything with, uh, with an AI is that data is very difficult to, to, uh, to obtain because data is seen as an asset. Nobody wants to share it. Data is, has privacy implications as well, so you have to be very careful. And in many cases, what you do to uh, anonymize data is something that cripples the, the utility of data for, for training. And, and well, even if you have the data, you don't know what the data mean in many cases. Because what you know is that there was an attack, but you don't know where the attack started. So if you're trying to make it for security, for example, you know where you were under attack, but you, didn't, you don't know exactly when the attack started, so you cannot train the machine to detect the real, to detect the real um, 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 hints of that an attack was happening. So the idea, the idea precisely, and we are, we are working heavily on this, is precisely on starting uh, mechanisms for the generation of synthetic data that is useful for training, is useful for validation, is useful for exploring metadata space and all the like. And if you look for the, uh, well, the term that we use for this is that uh, those uh, um, couple of images are related to something that we call, and, and we are running in our labs, that is called the mouse world. Basically, just to, to give you some ideas of how standards are taking shape in different uh, bodies, I am aware basically of what's going on. I mean, and I think it's the two bodies, two standards organizations that are more active when it comes to, uh, uh, to standardization, that are ETSI and the ITF. And, uh, well, this is a list of the, uh, what I think that are the challenges that we have ahead for making a feasible the application of AI to, to network management and to network transformation. These are list that somehow points, I'm taking into account the, the, the goal of this, uh, or one of the goals of this uh, meeting is precisely for you to think about how to shape uh, some proposals in the future. I won't go, but I see Valerie standing up and, and telling me that it's time to finish. So just to, just to leave you with a reflection, Take into account when you build anything that is uh, deal with AI, don't make monkeys too easy to, to train or machines too cheap. Just for you to know. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just maybe one question because we are uh, lacking time, but if there is one uh, urgent question to Diego, but it was, it was crystal clear. 
So th thanks a lot for this very entertaining presentation uh, about AI, explainable AI, responsible AI, and so on. But also AI as a weapon, uh, well, we need to have a lot of R&D to, to uh, be able to, to fight the different AIs if they are not uh, friendly ones. Um, yes, so. Yeah, so I will um, make a short presentation about the Celtic Next uh, ambition. So Celtic Next has actually been launched uh, this January for eight years. So the public authorities trust us uh, to, for, for, for having uh, next um, collaborative projects uh, uh, in the um, innovation for the co communication technology and its applications. So it's a flexible program. And um, what uh, actually I would like to say is actually Celtic Next is a, a public-private PPP based on national and regional and private funding. So there, there are different kinds of uh, fundings. So both the, the countries, but in some cases also the regions do have uh, funding. And Celtic uh, Next is actually organizing two calls per year, so in spring and autumn. So next one will be on the 14th of uh, October. Uh, it's open to any kind of uh, organization willing to, uh, to uh, do um, industry-driven ICT uh, research and innovation in, in uh, collaboration. So, uh, and we have already over 1,000 private and public uh, organizations, so any type of organization, so large industries, but SMEs, and you will hear uh, a success story for, from an SME just after this uh, presentation, and also research uh, institutions. So any, actually it's any kind of, of entities. So the program benefits, well, first it's uh, bottom-up, so you are uh, free to define uh, the content of your, um, of your proposal, so it's not uh, bound to any uh, uh, cold text, uh, so it's uh, welcoming any, any subject in the ICT uh, and, um, and vertical sectors. It's close to market, and um, so far projects have led to many uh, improved products and, and services, over 1,000. Uh, the average success rate of project proposal is uh, 60%, which is uh, a lot compared to some other programs, especially the commission program, where the competition is much more important. So it means high quality proposals have a good chance of receiving funding, which is uh, uh, very encouraging for, for you when, uh, when setting up a new, a new project proposal. And the, the flexi flexibility of the program has already been mentioned during the panel, because actually you are able to, um, to adapt the scope of your project during the, the project lifetime and also to, uh, to attract new project partners if you have some opportunities during the, the project lifetime as well. So it's, um, and also you, you, you can adapt to a new technological developments or also if the, the standardization, for example, as uh, as move in another direction. So, and you can see many uh, interesting uh, key, key figures, key performance indicators on, on, this, uh, on this slide. So the major objectives, well, are quite uh, generic. Uh, it's about uh, having successful and impactful projects, and we have um, a lot of success stories about that. Uh, a key, uh, a thing is that it's industry driven um, and we have both actually bottom up uh, projects, most of them, but we have also some more uh, top down uh, policy driven flagship projects, much bigger projects based on some uh, national strategic priorities. Uh, so it's uh, about uh, um, making uh, a key instrument for Europe European competitiveness. And for that, uh, we aim at uh, strengthening the interaction with our public authorities, both at uh, national level uh, and regional uh, initiatives, like some uh, regional clusters and uh, regional um, funding uh, bodies. So uh, the program needs to be very flexible, so to adapt to the changing landscape, 
uh, especially um, serving more, more vertical sectors. Um, for example, 5G uh, uh, will be integrating with the different sectors to uh, be able to, to uh, sustain their needs, and uh, 5G and the uh, next uh, generations. So that's why uh, our program needs also to uh, be more and more open to vertical sectors. And uh, we would like also to meet the need of uh, the citizens, in particular uh, in the mobility, but also in the EL sectors, and, and make sure that their privacy and security is uh, taken care of. Uh, so to adapt to these changing se sectors, we need to expand the, sect the Celtic community, so to uh, involve new players from the vertical sectors, and we have been already uh, welcoming uh, two uh, new core group members uh, in, the, in the Celtic uh, community, and one of them is Bosch, so from the automotive industry. So this is a trend that we will uh, uh, pursue. Uh, also, we want to strengthen the support to SMEs to reach the global market, including the startups, just like uh, uh, we heard uh, Kumuko in the panel and the, the spin-offs that are created as a result of the projects. Uh, that's our organization. So we have a, a core group of 18 uh, members from industry. Uh, we have the national uh, authorities uh, called Sec CELTAC. And we have today uh, two, uh, two representatives from Spain and from Sweden. Uh, and we, we have uh, an office and we, we have the different teams who are sustaining the, the whole program. So I, I let you uh, read the, the names of the, the companies. So it's uh, yeah, from the ICT uh, domain, both uh, the manufacturer, the telecom operators, and also some IT uh, suppliers, integrators, and also from the security area. Uh, so there is a long list that I will not read now <laughs> about our research items. So uh, you can find it on our website. Well, but you just need to know that it's all, uh, it, it, uh, co it embeds everything under network and infrastructure, but also at the um, service enablers and the application level the future internet and the cloud, and it, it has a multidisciplinary approach. So, uh, yeah, any uh, smart area like smart industry, smart health, uh, smart mobility, smart city, uh, and so on, they are actually covered by the scope of uh, Celtic Next, and even also the fintech area. So, a few words about uh, our success stories. So there have been uh, very successful projects. Uh, the, the Sigmona project that you were uh, already told about uh, by Kumuko in the panel about SDN in 5G. Um, uh, the Komosef uh, project about uh, mobility services uh, in the, in, uh, yeah, in, with large-scale large pilots for ITS. Uh, the UPSC that you were also uh, presented by Isil about uh, the power, unleashing the power of e-banking. Uh, we have also a lot of impact from our flagship projects, which are actually a huge projects, around 70 uh, to 80 million uh, euros. So the, the last two uh, flagship projects were called SASER, for secure communication for Europe and Sandate for secure networking for data center cloud in Europe. And they have achieved uh, a lot of impact, also uh, quite a number of uh, world uh, record uh, for, for transmission and uh, quantum safe transport. Uh, and also a lot, um, I mean, Sandate is not completely over now, but CESER, um, which, was, which is over since three years now, um, um, had 27 new products and 28 improved products. So that's a lot. And it achieved uh, 
record data transmission, allowing to make a, to take an example, the American Library of Congress to be the biggest library in the world to be transmitted in three seconds. So that's quite impressive. Um, we have also our success stories have been also awarded Eureka uh, Innovation Awards, four of them, which is a lot for one single cluster. Uh, so uh, one uh, was awarded to Hypermed project on, on ES, ELS project, and it was an SME-led project. Uh, and there's a one to um, uh, HFDC GFAST, which uh, was able to define a new um, standard for um, reusing the copper uh, in the home to, to, to be able to transmit, um, to, to have a um, very high rate and to avoid uh, having fiber in areas where it's very difficult to, to uh, install fiber. Uh, the NOTS project has been also awarded uh, Eureka Innovation Award and the Sigmona project just got this award uh, one month ago. So Celtic Next is um, to collaborate uh, at European level, but not only, because actually um, th there are uh, possibilities to collaborate with South Korea and Canada. Uh, and in the future with other countries like Japan. So we have already, uh, sorry, we have already partners from South Korea uh, and, and Canada in some of our projects uh, and we do organize specific um, webinars uh, to, to have uh, project pitches at a time wh wh which are suitable to them and to allow uh, networking as they cannot always come to proposals day like this one because it's too uh, too expensive and too far away. So just to let you know that if you wish to work with those countries, it's also possible. So Celtic Next is the solution for you if you want to perform a collaborative R&D project in Europe and beyond, if you want to get public funding support, uh, to, to have a high uh, funding rate, low administrative overhead, uh, flexible framework, and for sure high exploitation potential and business impact. And um, yeah, we have a great asset in Celtic Dex because uh, so far we are the only Eureka cluster to have both uh, top down and bottom up project. And, and so uh, we, we have different opportunities to, uh, to collaborate. It's either that you have an ID and you uh, can convince the public authorities to, to fund it and then, yeah, this ID comes from industry, but there are also uh, flagship projects where it's really national strategic priorities where some countries would like to have big initiative and in those flagship projects you will know that you will get uh, big support from those countries and, big in, in, and then it will achieve big impact. So we should better use those opportunities uh, and have uh, uh, not only a um, bottom-up project but also uh, quite a number of uh, strategic themes that uh, some countries would like to, to support for the benefit of both national economies for sure and industrial partners. So, uh, so this is an exciting framework and well, we can work for the future. Um, first, uh, in, in Celtic project, we accelerate innovations through um, ecosystem creation and exploitation because in some ca cases you bring together partners in one project that at the beginning don't know them, uh, each other too well but then you, uh, uh, you um, achieve this nice collaboration and you work uh, further. Uh, then uh, it's about also achieving competitiveness, uh, economic prosperity and social well-being uh, in a way that it is uh, sponsored by the countries, it is delivered by industry and it is for sure for the benefit of all. And in some projects, it's really 
the impact of the project is really delivering sustainability for the, for the planet. So uh, that's uh, uh, an important also social, social goal and envi environmental goal that we should not forget. So thank you very much. And um, well, don't think we have time. Do we have time for one question, Peter? Oh, in, just in case. Yes, please, Tessos. Yes, uh, so far there has been a delegation uh, that we met uh, from NEDO. Uh, actually, they, uh, the NEDO doesn't, so far doesn't have too much money for internal co collaboration, but they are very interested to collaborate with uh, Eureka clusters and Celtic in particular. So uh, I think this will take a bit time to develop, but in any case, we have already um, uh, work with some Japanese uh, co companies in some Celtic projects. Uh, for example, Entity was part of one Celtic project in the past. And um, there has been also a research institute, Japanese research institute, part of another project. So it's a case, so far it's a case by case. So uh, I think if a Japanese partner is interested in your project and you are also interested in that kind of collaboration, this should be investigated. And I think in the future, there may be more uh, opportunities and more, more funding for, for Japanese companies, but it's already possible on a case by case. So then I would like to um, welcome uh, Stenis Solitude from uh, Perfect Memory uh, for a successful uh, uh, from, uh, for a success story uh, from an SME. So thank you, uh, Steny. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm very proud to be here to, uh, to talk about uh, our uh, experience uh, in Celtic because we are sure that we won't be here without the support of, uh, of Celtic. Uh, we aim at uh, reinvent uh, what is at the very heart of uh, any business. Uh, I mean the, the data governance, the data management, in when everything, uh, any uh, economic uh, actors are, is now connected uh, to the network and need to collect, uh, interpret and make any data and document available for, for its business. So, uh, yes, we, on, we, we are a former, we, we are a winner of uh, Skeltic Award and we, we aim at uh, working on a, a specific link on, on the business, the missing link between uh, the users and the networks. Because we, we, we used to, to think that we just need to push things on the network and it will work. But, uh, Actually, we need to prepare uh, the data and the document to, to, to maximize their impact uh, in, onto their, their target. So we need to set the data uh, ready for, for the network. We need to empower the customer and the partner uh, its ecosystem in order to, to let them uh, access the, the, the proper information. And we need to be able to deal with any kind of content. So it's, it's, a, it's a real challenge because what we want to do is to transform in any data into uh, business assets uh, available for the business. So maybe we need to, to uh, be more specific, more precise on what we, where we are today. Maybe you remember the web it was dealing with documents, okay? Then we had the cloud which is dealing with applications. But today, actually, we need to cope with cognitive platforms that will be, um, cognitive platforms that will be connected the one with the other, like a brain. Because what we want to do is to refine the content, like we can refine oil, okay? And when we refine things, it means we want to collect information, we need to process information, and we need to t make decision and make it available. So j just let me show what, what it can, 
what it, what it looks like at the very top, at the top of the iceberg. So this is a, a screencast of uh, Trouvé, which is dealing with um, improve the user experience. Because the point is to be able to, to search in a simple way, but search into deep information, into a very large volume of content, we, we, into a highly connected document, and make it, uh, make it easy and quick, fast to access. Okay. So this is what we have done. Uh, we, we have built up the, the, the basis of this, uh, such an application during the cell take. And we mixed the, the benefits from, let's say, a Google-like approach and a semantic approach. And Diego, you remember semantic? And that way, you can connect different points of views you can connect di different kinds of documents. You can connect different, different kinds of organization and put everything together, together in a meaningful way. Even manage the right associated to any fragment of information. Uh, maybe you heard about uh, GDPR in, in Europe. You need to, to be able to deal with this kind of, of constraint, legal constraint. So we ingest the content, we index the content, we cementize the content, and then we make it available into our user's context. And the context could be, could be a sport context, like we can see here. And if you are a sports federation, you will be able to provide an access to any of your content, of your, uh, any part of your catalog, to the end users in a very uh, simple way. Okay, make your asset come alive, be efficient, and be um, connected. So to do, to do this kind of, to address this kind of challenge, we had to connect the two branches of uh, artificial intelligence. Because if you, just, uh, if you just consider the machine learning aspect of the artificial intelligence, you have a kind of hemiplegic uh, brain. Something is missing. So you need to connect the, the semantics, which is, which is dealing with factual information, facts, rules, and heuristic information, which is dealing with what you can discover with uh, statistics, etc. And when you put together these two, uh, these two aspects, you are able to, to set up a new technical paradigm to, to process, interpret, and, and uh, refine the content, refine the data. And then you can disrupt the digital asset management market, which is around uh, 10, uh, 7 billion euro uh, today. Okay? And uh, something that we can call a digital asset management as a brain will be able to address the, the different part of uh, the, the different segment of the digital asset management market. Okay? So, what we have done is to, we have been able to collect, interpret, uh, it is French, sorry for that. And uh, we, have, we have a platform that takes as an input any kind of content, then semantize it. So it means that we are able to project the content into a semantic space. And then the content will be avail available to be exploited at the, at, the, at the end of the workflow. So, actually, uh, Celtic uh, is, maybe if I can advise, uh, it, it's very uh, a competitive approach because you are, uh, it's a way to, to identify quickly if you are in, uh, if you are in, uh, you have the, the good approach. Uh, it's an opportunity to test your, your, uh, your technology or your um, scenario on you, with uh, end users. And uh, you, it's a way to test the market. So uh, it's worth it. And actually, perfect memory is ready to apply again. Because now we, we, have, been, uh, we, we have finished our MA uh, 
uh, with uh, uh, a French company, and we are we are scaling fast now. So, since we are scaling fast, we need to we need new resources. We need developers, we need marketing, and we need sales. So come and see me if you are interested. Thank you. Are there questions for Steny? No? Yes, later. Uh, Steny, maybe you could elaborate a little bit on who are your clients? Yes. Uh, so, we, we need to, to select our, our market since we are, we are a startup. So, we started with a media company like RTL, like RTBF, uh, Radio France, and then we have, we have, um, we have uh, extended to the sport uh, business cases like Eurovision, uh, sports Eurovision, or um, uh, football, uh, a big fo French football, football club. I can't tell the name, but uh, you, you can imagine. Uh, and uh, uh, the government uh, came and, and asked us, uh, asked, uh, us to, to work with them on the, on, to set up the, the French uh, governmental uh, intelligence platform. So we are involved in a very big project in French dealing with uh, intelligence services. And we are ready to uh, to extend now to the retail market. So this is our four uh, main verticals. So ontology is not a big word, and since everything starts and finishes with semantics, you'd better connect semantics to everything you you <coughs> you you are, you are doing with AI. Last question? Or was it clear? Okay. Thank so you. thank you very much, Steny. So it's good to see we are very successful SMEs. So we'll go now to the award ceremony. So we'll be handling four uh, awards, Celtic uh, awards, because there is one innovation award and uh, three excellence awards. Uh, so, for that, I will ask uh, Juana Sanchez from CDTI to come to stage to uh, give the uh, award certificate. And so, it's really a very good um, moment then when we are so happy to uh, reward the, our very successful projects. So the. Innovation Award is about a um, project that finished between 2015 and 2017. It's about to see the, really the, the impact, uh, the economic impact after the project has finished. And so we are very happy uh, to say that NUTS uh, is awarded this uh, Innovation Award. And so I will tell you a little bit more about NUTS project before we ask the, the project uh, leader to come on stage. Um, so the, the NUTS um, project, well, you've heard already a bit from uh, Antonio so, uh, in the panel. So the, the main activities were about uh, new media distribution architectures for OTT contents, also novel methods for quality of experience, estimation, and um, development of new business models where the traditional operators could get their share of the raising OTT business. So there has been a lot of, uh, of impact um, and the economic uh, uh, benefit of the project was measured by a return of investment up to 10 times, which is really a lot uh, for both the industry and SMEs. They have been achieving 27 new improved products and uh, the project has permitted a sig significant increase in sales of TV to 
ITAM, the OTT Commercial Service of Orange Poland, also in Watson, which is Andrea's OTT TV service in Finland, and the launching of, um, of a SAPA Play OTT service in Sweden. And they have been um, decimate, uh, having over 110 um, activities in dissemination. So contribution to seven contributions to standardization bodies, 77 scientific publications, which is a lot, uh, 17 PhD and, uh, and master thesis, five patents, and, and seven press releases. So please, I would like to welcome uh, on stage uh, uh, Antonio Cola Sanchez from Indra. loaded. Yeah, I don't know what's happening. Yeah, please, Antonio, if you want to. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Valerie. Yeah, well, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Celtic Next Office, right, uh, for this uh, incredible uh, prize. And then all the public authorities uh, from the different countries that have funded the project in, in Spain, the CDTI, uh, in, in, in Portugal, uh, Portugal uh, 2020, in, uh, in France, DGE. Uh, in uh, Finland, Tekes, uh, well, now Business Finland, um, in Sweden, Vinnova, right? And in the end, uh, um, the Polish Public Authority, right? Thank you very much. Oh, okay. Yes, big applause to um, Antonio and the Nuts project. It's the third uh, award in a row for one project, so. <laughs> I think you will have not enough place in your office to put all the awards. But thank you very much for these, those very great results. So.
Yes, so now we will uh, hand over the Excellence Award, so that's for projects that have uh, finished recently. So the, the first one will be in the category Network Technologies. And I'm happy to say that So Green Project uh, won um, this, this award. Uh, so Celtic Project um, is about service-oriented optimization of green mobile networks. Uh, it's actually led by Orange. Uh, and it's, uh, it's about reducing the energy consumption of services uh, and to improve the mobile network architecture and content delivery, taking advantage of smart grids. Uh, so there have been many achievements, including the uh, sharing model of energy responsibility between categories deployed in real networks, features implemented in real networks and brought to standardization, uh, uh, standardization, standardization action and retransfer to 5G trials. They have been also achieving some passive cooling techniques. Uh, so it's actually good for the, not only for the bill of uh, the telecom operator, but it's really good for the environment. Um, and they have been interacting with uh, the, the smart grid and the mobile operator with the local energy grid, uh, the energy system and the links between the four domains. Uh, and they have been doing energy saving in Wi-Fi networks in absolute values. So I would like to call on stage uh, Dominique Baudere, who is a uh, So Green project leader. an energy market mechanism for dynamic network sharing by using game theory. We demonstrated 20 to 80 percent savings of energy depending on the load of the network with all operators making profit. Many of our equipments are at full power even though they don't need to. We managed to decrease the consumption for mobile access by using different levels of sleep modes. It's not so easy, as there is a trade-off between network performance and energy savings. Our research defines optimal parameter settings that's, that, once implemented, save 2.8% of the total energy consumption. For the Swedish tele network, this is more energy than what is needed for a BMW i3 driving around the world every day. My name is Piotr Rodrigues from ProEV and I was the work package leader of dissemination and standardization. When a project is well led, with good working environment and with a single objective, energy efficiency, results happen naturally. During this project, we were able to, to create a communication channel to the community. We were able to organize two workshops. We wrote more than 40 journal and conference papers and actively contributed in 3GPP, ITU and that's it.
Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks also to uh, Celtic and also all the public authorities and for sure all, all of the 16 partners. Yes, very good collaborative work. And I know that in Sweden, um, they were also very happy with the project results. So next uh, award is in the application area. And so we are happy to hand over the award to ISRI project on eHealth. So uh, ISRI project from Willings uh, SME uh, company is actually the follow-up project of Hypermed project, which also got uh, awarded some years ago. Uh, so history designed and implemented uh, an end-to-end -end platform to allow EL services to both rural and urban areas for both patients and professionals. So it has been really extending the, the results from Hypermed project um, so addressing all the communication types and, and new uh, compression techniques and it extending the, the service scenarios. So they have been testing the developments in 15 uh, healthcare scenarios, so professional to professional, professional to patient and patient to patient. It has been validated by doctors and so they, they have really uh, reduced the, the system complexity uh, by using a web RTC uh, solution, so improving uh, customer connection and allowing asymmetric and mobile connection. Uh, so the solution can be used by professionals on the move, so not only from their offices, so providing e-health services everywhere. Uh, and they, because they have been able to reduce the, the minimum bandwidth for the video, from three uh, megabit per second to one megabit per second. And this is how technology can really uh, reach uh, everybody uh, everywhere. So please, uh, Os Oscar Chabrera, please come to stage to receive your award from, from Spain, from CDTI. <laughs> Village, as an SME, is honored to lead E3 Eureka Celtic Plus Consortium. It is the living artificial intelligence company able to understand and catalog your raw videos and make them fully searchable, allowing professionals to surf inside the video. It provides the best-in-class metadata for video, text, and images. It also provides the most relevant tags about the content, even indicating if a concept appears visually or is mentioned in the audio. E3 allows everybody access to e-health services everywhere. It is a cross-domain project led by Village Spain, which has been able to attract not only partners from five European countries like France, Finland, Poland, Spain and Turkey, but also four hospitals and seven SMEs as external project collaborators, which were self-funded. The project main achievements are a first course on brain anatomy coupled to an awake-like surgery allowing 250 students simultaneously attending versus three to five possibly present in an operating room. Future surgeons get access to better training and life experience. Also, more than 30,000 viewers from 91 countries attended the fourth European Laryngological Life Surgery Broker Session. We have also been present in three medical congresses. Each EVC proposed medical test video sequences, which have been accepted for the MPEG video test set for future development of video coding standards. 
we have summarized and indexed the visual information allowing professionals to have a quick summary of the recorded sessions, as well as to navigate and discover information inside a video. The project has been awarded the EVI Nova Bronze Award the 4th of November of 2015, and three startups have been created to commercialize project results. First of all, thank you to Celtic for this award. It's a, a three uh, honor for us, mainly because we are an SME. As an SME, it's quite difficult to be awarded and to manage a European project. So I would like to invite all the partners to come here to have a photo all together, because really it's not the award of the, it's all our award. Then uh, it's also an honor because uh, we are in my city, I live here in Valencia, so it's, it's, I'm proud to receive the honor here. And also it's important for us because, uh, as mentioned, we have been also working from the Hypermed project and we have kept the consortium and we have kept all the people working all together. So congratulations again, and maybe our health will depend on your projects in the future, so we are very grateful. So I, I will now um, talk about the last um, award on, in the category multimedia. So I'm happy to announce that for Keprosis uh, is actually awarded this excellence uh, award. Um, yeah, I need to find my notes. <laughs> yes. So uh, for Keprosis uh, um, has been led by AMP uh, France. And uh, the, the, the project has been uh, very successful um, in, uh, with a specialized video production ecosystem. Uh, they, they have been uh, involved in a major event like the FIFA World Cup last year. Uh, and uh, they have also been involved a lot in standardization activities. And uh, they have been exploiting the, the project results actually uh, before the end of the project. Uh, for example, with a um, wireless camera link already in production uh, in June last year and for a new tracking antenna systems uh, mounted and used in content production and for the advertisement insertion uh, system. They have also uh, prototyped some uh, HEVC uh, LL codec that are in test field at EBU since uh, May last year. And they have also been able to have some video up and downstream from and to an aircraft using uh, LTU, LTE standard. So that was uh, possible to uh, address uh, live events like uh, motorsport races or other sport events, so live, live events. So please. So, uh, yes.
15 new people hired. That's great. <laughs> Would you like to comment, Francois and Marco? Uh, I'm Francois Vladou from AMP. Like uh, on TV show, I have my prompter because we do that <laughs> on TV. Uh, we are very happy uh, to honor the, and to receive this award. And this was uh, our first uh, participated on a type of, of R&D project. And Celtic enables companies uh, to reach a good level of technical development in partnership with the major universities. Financial support uh, is always become uh, during this phase of development. It's very great. For care purposes, I developed I deliver a unique RF transmission solution for operation, audiovisual, filming, and the end of the project. Thanks to all Celtic decision makers, and particularly to Director Peter Hellman and his team. On behalf of EPFL, New League, INSA, Temple University, Supono, CLU, Carway, World Rings, Eurovision, and AMP TV, thank you again. So thanks a lot to all uh, pro project uh, awardees and we'll uh, make a last picture with all of you on the stage. So please come back. Yeah. So tomorrow morning you can enjoy visiting the, the booth of the project and we'll have the, the Celtic uh, pitches uh, tomorrow afternoon. So if ever you are interested to su submit a last minute pitch, don't hesitate and come to see uh, Peter and Christiane. And well, and I wish you, we wish you all a very nice end of afternoon and evening. Thanks a lot.